and we're going live now. Awesome. Thank you. Of course. Well, good morning and welcome to OHSU's public board of directors meeting today. We are now well over a year of virtual meetings, so this should be all be second nature. But as a reminder to the board members, please keep yourself muted unless you're speaking. Make sure to identify yourself for the record before you speak and use the chat feature only to indicate if you'd like to say something. As I said before, I'll try to do better at noting, noting that. I'd like to officially welcome Jim Carlson to the board. Jim recently retired from Oregon Healthcare Association where he served as CEO since 1997. He's widely recognized as one of the leading long-term care and health policy resources in Oregon, and we are thrilled to have him. It has been a tremendous year and I'm proud of OHSU and the role you all have played in managing and leading through the pandemic and all the other challenges that have come our way. And I mentioned this in my comments to the graduates at the convocation. I couldn't be prouder to see the community come out and handle the virus and the vaccination and the testing and all the things that we've done. So all kudos to the university community. Wildfires, financial struggles, and action and initiatives to address social justice efforts have compounded the stress and overwhelmed OHSU members and those in our communities all over the state. You've adapted and responded at each and every stop and I think we can all confidently say we are rounding the final corner on the pandemic. I'd like to thank OHSU for everything they have done to get Oregon to this place, particularly, as I said, with regard to testing and vac vaccination and community engagement to reach underserved populations. So as we round that corner, hopefully we'll all get together live and in person for a future meeting coming up sometime. But as usual, we're, we have a full agenda. We expect to go just over three hours, but I will note that we have built in a 20 minute break halfway through. So we will try to stay on, on track. So we make sure we use that break and give everybody a chance to, uh, to get themselves together. Today, we'll be hearing from CFO Lawrence Fernstahl on F1 21 fin year to date financial results and the proposed budget for FY 22. And we always know that that is a um, interesting item to go through. Dr. Elena Andreessen will present the academic tuition and fee book. Dr. Karen Eden will present the faculty senate response to the budget. And we'll get an update on OHSU 2025 from Bridget Barnes, Connie Seely, and Wayne Shields. As we continue our regular updates on diversity, equity, inclusion, and anti-racism efforts, we'll hear from Dr. Derek DeVivier. Dr. Don Spite will join us to get, brief us on the work of the Vaccine Equity Committee. And Dr. Susan Bakewell Sachs and Dr. Karen Riefenstein will talk about the diversity, equity, inclusion, and anti racism work happening within the School of Nursing. Really a lot to go, go over, a lot of important ground to cover. So at this point, I'll turn it over to Dr. Jacobs uh, for his opening remarks before we dive, dive in. So, Danny, over to you. Oh, well, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure again to be here and provide an update. Uh, I'll try to be brief. Wanted to spend some time talking about uh, COVID-19, the topic that has dominated our lives for the past year and a half or so. Last week, Oregon reached the lowest new COVID-19 case count in a year. And I, I hope and it feels like uh, we're turning the corner on the pandemic. Uh, I think it's important to note that thanks to the collective actions taken by Oregonians during the last 16 months, Oregon has the fourth lowest number of deaths per capita in the US. According to our lead data scientist, Dr. Peter Graven, Oregon could have had three times as many deaths had we performed like the US average across all states. Our university has had a hand in administering more than 900,000 vaccination doses, and the vast majority of those have taken place at the Oregon Convention Center the PDX Airport and the Hillsborough Stadium. Uh, we all feel it's been an incredible honor and privilege to serve the state of Oregon in this capacity, and we thank all of our members for their efforts. Although uh, mass vaccination sites are closing down, we will continue to vaccinate patients at our Multnomah Pavilion of the Richmond Clinic and the Scapoose Clinic locations, and we plan to offer vaccines at other OHSU clinics in the coming weeks. 
Uh, in addition, uh, our Vaccine Equity Committee, and you'll hear more about that later as Chair Munfries mentioned, uh, our Vaccine Equity Committee will continue to collaborate with community organizations and faith leaders, for example, to help vaccinate difficult to reach and underserved communities. Now, just today, Governor Brown announced that most health and safety restrictions will be lifted on June 30, or when 70% of uh, adults in Oregon have received the first doses of the vaccine, whichever comes first. So we are so close. We have to be mindful about the impact of the variants. We have to think about lessons learned as we go into the future. Uh, but I am cautiously optimistic, uh, optimistic, and I look forward to resuming something that's closer to our traditional summer activities and gatherings. Some more data, uh, just some additional factoids here. As of June 16, Oregon dropped to 162 hospitalized COVID-19 patients. The percent of occupied ICU beds with COVID-19 patients has dropped to 7%. And the hospitalization rate of COVID-19 cases as of uh, May 22nd is 5.3%. So these trends are certainly encouraging, uh, but we still are experiencing uh, significant and severe capacity challenges at our health system and our hospitals. And this is the same thing that's happening uh, with other hospital and health systems statewide. Our facilities remain very full and staffing is at a, critically, uh, at a critical point. Uh, so with Dr. Hunter's leadership and his team and others, we continue to pursue all strategies uh, that are accessible to us to free up beds, as well as to handle our staffing issues and fill essential and vitally important clinical roles. We actually expect to see demand for inpatient care increase for the foreseeable future, and we uh, will need to continue to be flexible and adapt as the demands arise. Uh, but throughout all of this, our teams have made tremendous efforts, uh, especially on the heels of uh, of one of the most challenging periods of our lifetime. Uh, these efforts are uh, those where we want to continue to meet the needs of the community and uphold the highest standards for uh, patient care and staff safety. Uh, in other news, U.S. News and World Reports ranked Ochishu Dornberger as uh, one of the best children's hospitals in the region and the nation, leading in several pediatric specialties. For example, Dorn Brecker was recognized in cancer, diabetes, and infernology, neonatology, nephrology, nephrology and uh, neurology and neurosurgery. Uh, Dorn Brecker is also among the top 10 children's hospitals in the Pacific region and ranks first uh, in the state of Oregon. On the research front, we've not been idle. OHC scientists have developed a new approach to gene therapy that leans on the common uh, pain reliever acetaminophen or Tylenol uh, to force a variety of genetic diseases into remission. Very exciting initial, very exciting initial observation. Uh, I can't hide everything, but here's some things we're just calling out as examples of our research uh, uh, productivity. There was a paper published in a, a journal called Science Translational Medicine by Dr. Marcus Lumpy, who is professor of pediatrics and molecular and medical genetics. And this paper describes um, how a novel technique successfully treated blood clotting disorders like hemophilia, and uh, as well as a, a metabolic disease that's called phenylketonuria or PKU in mice. Another important observation in advance is that our cancer researchers say that they've established a new life extending, extending treatment option for men with prostate cancer, where their prostate cancer is spread and become resistant to hormone therapy, which is the standard practice. So this is an injected treatment. It combines a targeting compound with a radioactive isotope to specifically eradicate and kill these cancer cells. Uh, Dr. Tom Beer, who is one of the study leaders and deputy director of our Knight Cancer Institute, believes this completely new novel treatment option can extend life and control disease in the most aggressive and deadly types of prostate cancer. Moving on to the education mission, uh, we are also proud to have graduated a, the next generation, a new generation of healthcare professionals, educators, and researchers this month. Total of about 1,300 degrees were awarded, and we were honored that uh, Governor Tate Brown provided the keynote address this year. 
This class of graduates has faced uh, atypical and extraordinarily challenging circumstances, but I believe that uh, in addition to their regular course of study, these experiences will only enhance their ability to have a positive impact on the health and well-being of the communities that they will serve worldwide, and I think will help them as members of the community. We'd like to thank the Oregon Legislature for their continued support and investment in OHSU. The recently passed State General Fund appropriation for OHSU's education programs will help us keep tuition increases to a minimum, and you'll hear more about that from Dr. Andreessen later on. Now, of course, as we close out the academic year, we are also saying farewell to Provost Elena Andresen, who is retiring effective June 30. I'd like to say that uh, she uh, is a driven scholar and has been a loyal partner. She devoted her talent, leadership, and expertise to OTSU's education missions for the School of Medicine, Nursing, Dentistry, Pharmacy, Public Health, and other healthcare professional programs and initiatives for more than nine years of service. Uh, we wish her all the best in retirement, and I'd like to, of course, publicly thank her for her service and dedication. Uh, Dr. David Robinson, yeah, that was, we can apply to you on the chair there. Thank you, Elena. <laughs> Bravo. <laughs> Dr. Uh, David Robinson will serve as interim provost while we complete a national search uh, for the permanent provost. And I'd like to say, as always, we greatly appreciate Dr. Robinson's willingness to continue his exemplary efforts in support of our university and our academic mission. Um, School of Medicine Dean Sharon Anderson recently announced that she intends to step down as Dean effective September 30. Uh, there are many uh, highlights in her exemplary career and she's made many contributions. I'd just like to highlight a few. Uh, as Professor of Medicine, uh, Dr. Anderson was appointed Dean of the School of Medicine in July 2017. Her previous roles included, but are not limited, not limited to uh, serving as Associate Dean for Faculty Development and Faculty Affairs in the School of Medicine, Chief of the Division of Hospital, Hospital and Specialty Medicine at the VA Portland Healthcare System, and interim, and interim, and then permanent chair of the Department of Medicine. Uh, we've not yet announced who would be interim dean, but we'll share that information broadly about, uh, once uh, someone has been appointed. Finally, um, uh, in other operational news, uh, we began lifting modified operations, which we adapted in response to COVID-19 in a phased manner on June 21st. Uh, this uh, resumption of what I think we should call, what we think we should call our new normal will be gradual and phased, but we expect to have that uh, be completed by September 7th. We recently announced our intention to implement a COVID-19 vaccination requirement mandate for all OHSU members with badge access by September 1st, importantly to the fullest extent allowed by law. We believe that this is in line with our commitment to improving the health and well being of all Oregonians and supports our desire to provide a safe work, learning, and patient care environment for the communities we serve. And of course, as is happening around the nation, uh, and guided by, again, best practices, exceptions will be allowed. But we think this is the right approach for our university. So, uh, on behalf of the university, we'd like to thank everyone for their support and dedication uh, through a very tumultuous time. We certainly have more work ahead of us, but as always, I remain supremely confident in our members, in our leaders, in our team, and our ability to face the challenges that come our way uh, in support of our continuing obligation and duty to attend to the health and well being of those in Oregon and beyond. So thank you, Ms. Montreese. Uh, I, I complete my report. Thank you, Dr. Jacobs. So um, the board members have the minutes of the April 26, or the April 16 meeting in their books. Um, I will call for a motion to approve those minutes. So moved, Chad Paulson. Is there a second? Second, Stacey Chamberlain. Approval of the minutes is moved and seconded. Any questions? Seeing none in the chat, uh, I will turn it over to Ms. Seeley for the roll. Uh, on this one, Chair, I bet I bet we could just do a, a voice vote and ask if there's any no's. 
All in favor? Say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, uh, the minutes are approved. Thank you for that process improvement. <laughs> See, we're still learning. <laughs> I will turn it over to Mr. Fernstall for the FY21 year-to-date results and budget. Uh, thank you, Chair Momfries, members of the board. I'm here to present an update on OHSU's financial results and propose for your consideration the fiscal year 22 budget. Next slide, please. One year ago, we faced a potential financial abyss. The Oregon State Economist projected a 20% loss of jobs, followed by a four-year recovery. There was also an enormous level of uncertainty. So under President Jacobs' direction, OHSU adopted the approach of tightening first to loosen later. Next slide. Tragically, over 600,000 Americans and millions throughout the world have died from COVID-19. However, Congress and the Federal Reserve have injected $9 trillion of fiscal and monetary support into the economy. Effective vaccines were developed in only a year and are now widely available in our state. Oregon has had fewer reported COVID cases per capita than all other states but Vermont and Hawaii. And OHSU has navigated the pandemic and recovered faster than anticipated. Next slide. At the beginning of the pandemic, OHSU's revenues plunged from 199, OHSU's patient revenues plunged from $199 million per month to a low of $128 million in April 2020, shown in red. We were unsure how fast clinical activity would recover, but this April, revenues reached $219 million, shown in green although with significant month-to-month -month variation. Next slide. Pre-COVID, OHSU's operating income target was $145 million per year, or about $12 million per month, shown as the dotted purple line. In April 2020, we recorded a loss of $68 million for a negative swing of approximately $80 million in the month. Earnings recovered rapidly in the summer, allowing restoration of salary reductions taken by 4,500 faculty and managers. But this year are averaging $5 million per month, nearly 60% below prior levels. Next slide. Last June's budget document included a table of sensitivity to key assumptions. This slide uses those figures to analyze the improvement in FY21 results from the original deficit of $95 million, shown in red, to the currently estimated gain for the year of $60 million, shown in green at the bottom. Faster clinical volume recovery to 99% of pre-COVID levels instead of 92% adds $120 million. No payer mix shift, despite the loss of jobs, adds $93 million. No cuts in state funding, together adds another $41 million. Full salary restoration to the 45 members who incurred reductions equaled $90 million of costs, while a $5,000 lump sum payment to supervisors and managers is about $10 million. The net result is estimated FY21 operating income of $60 million, much better than the loss originally forecast, but still $85 million less than the prior year budget target of $145 million, and $88 million below the 10% EBITDA margin in the pre-pandemic OHSU incentive plan. As you know, we use OHSU's earnings to invest in people, programs, and places that support the forward growth of the university and our missions of education, research, patient care, and outreach for the people of Oregon. Next slide. Across OHSU, units have developed bottom-up detail on revenues, hiring, and costs that add up to the proposed budget for FY22 presented here. The budget reflects current year results, the decline in COVID patients as vaccination proceeds, planning for a new normal with hybrid telecommuting, 
active recruitment of nurses and other staff to meet strong demand for tertiary and quaternary services, and OHSU's 2025 focus on putting people first. Next slide. In a nutshell, the budget is nearly $3.9 billion, funded on the left by patient care revenues, followed by research grants and gifts, tuition and state appropriations, and IGT funding for research and education, plus other sources. The largest expenditures on the right are for salaries and benefits, followed by pharmacy and medical supplies and other non-labor costs, with 6.5% for existing and new capital, represented by depreciation, interest, and operating income, shown in blue, purple, and white. This compares to 10% in pre-COVID budgets. Next slide. Next year, revenues are up 7.5%, or $273 million, from our estimate for this year. In FY22, the increase in compensation of 191 million will absorb 70% of this revenue growth compared to 60% historically. Next slide. Overall, compensation increases 8.8%, including 3.7% average wage and benefit growth and 1,200 new or refilled full-time equivalent positions, offset somewhat by a usual vacancy factor. These additional FTEs span missions and support areas, including increasing the size of the faculty, supporting clinical and research growth, advancing OHSU 2025 strategic initiatives, and filling critical administrative staff jobs held vacant during the pandemic. Next slide. In mid FY20, we began managing the budget of OHSU Health and the School of Medicine on a combined direct margin basis, shown here as a percent of gross margin, which is total revenues minus pharmacy and medical supplies. This approach recognizes the centrality of the clinical faculty practice to the hospital's revenues and expenses, as well as the interdependence across patient care, research, and education in the work of the School of Medicine faculty. Most of OHSU's patient revenue is in this budget grouping and thus it was most severely impacted by COVID-19. The direct margin fell from a pre-pandemic 21% to 14% last year, before partially recovering to 16% in next year's budget. Next slide. For several years now, OHSU Health has managed with very high inpatient occupancy, while average complexity of cases continues to increase. Next year, most of the clinical growth occurs in complex outpatient settings, such as ambulatory surgery and chemotherapy. We will also continue to expand access to OHSU through both in-person and virtual visits. Next slide. In the research arena, OHSU will be getting back to work as modified operations are lifted in stages. Coming into COVID, the School of Medicine grant awards were up 14%, and Center and Institute awards grew by 27%. Some of those were deferred at the beginning of COVID and will now be spent. Clinical trials were especially impacted by pandemic restrictions and are also projected to pick up uh, significantly next year. Gifts provide essential complementary funding to cover costs of science not fully reimbursed by grants as does IGT or the Intergovernmental Transfer Program in par partnership with the state. Next slide. As the provost will present in a few minutes, the budget proposes a tuition rate increase of no more than 2% with continuation of the OHSU tuition promise where students in covered programs pay their entering tuition without further increase for the expected length of study such as four years for MD degrees. Overall tuition revenue next year is flat with the 2% rate increase offset by lower enrollment due to learner placement challenges. The OHSU 2025 strategic plan includes efforts to directly address this problem with the goal of restoring class sizes over the next several years 
and eventually increasing them where workforce demands warrant. Next slide. Since 2000, OHSU has partnered with the state of Oregon to match federal dollars that help fund the Oregon Health Plan and reduce the loss that OHSU Health would ordinarily incur on Medicaid services. This in turn allows gains from commercial coverage that would otherwise cover these larger losses to be reallocated to support research and education, helping to fulfill our unique role as Oregon's Public Health Sciences University. In FY22, we have budgeted $136 million of IGT funding allocated to research and education capital projects to base support across academic units that recognizes that grants do not cover the full cost of research and tuition plus state appropriations do not cover the full cost of education. The strategic list funds specific initiatives in recruitment and academic programs, while the final 17 million funds non-clinical OHSU 2025 objectives and anti-racism work. Next slide. When the pandemic began, we reduced the capital budget to $135 million, rather than increasing it in line with depreciation. Next year, we propose catching up with $190 million, allocated between infrastructure and replacement on one hand, and new capacity and OHSU 2025 initiatives on the other, and approximately evenly spread between healthcare projects and research and education areas. Notable investments include expansion of cancer infusion, PET MRI imaging, fetal surgery center, surge facility and freezer farm on the West Campus, continuation of Volum Institute renovation, laboratory expansion in the Robinson Life Sciences Building, data security, simulation expansion for education, as well as routine replacement and upgrade of building and data systems, such as elevators, electrical vaults, and network servers. Next slide, please. In the decade from fiscal year 12 to fiscal year 22, revenues increased by 96%, but capital measured by depreciation and interest by only 45%. Without robust investment in facilities, equipment, and technology, OHSU's faculty and staff will not have the places to do their best work. With this capital, we have balanced cash flow proposed for next year. Sources of cash in the FY22 budget total $277 million from operating income adding back depreciation plus 4% expected return on OHSU held cash and investments. Uses of cash total nearly an equivalent $273 million including principal repayment on existing bond debt, an equivalent prepayment of PERS pension liability, funding working capital, the capital budget expenditures I just referred to, plus $5 million for a faculty initiative pool from FY21 earnings. This pool will provide grants for capital expenditures, equipment purchases, leadership or other training, and similar one-time items in support of the faculty. Next slide. Balanced cash flow combined with an approximately 8% growth in spending results in drawing down OHSU's days cash on hand from 238 days currently to 219 at the end of FY22. In addition, most of the interest-free CARES Act loans shown in blue should be recouped by the federal government with the rest due in December 2022. On net, OHSU maintains roughly level liquidity relative to our size over this time period, 2018 through 2022, and about 15% less cash than our national peers that are also rated AA minus, which is shown on the dotted purple line at the top. Next slide. While top line recovery has been much faster than the long four year slog feared one year ago, projected revenues next year remain about $333 million below the pre pandemic trend. Next slide. 
OHSU's pre-COVID financial challenge was the gap between payment rate growth and unit cost inflation. Our response was sustained growth to spread fixed costs across the larger base. Combined with a step function up from IGT, pharmacy, and major gifts, this growth sustained a robust level of investment in people and programs, and to a lesser extent, in technology, equipment, facilities, and other infrastructure. This financial model was able to sustain margins, but does not increase them, leaving open how we recoup lost ground from the lower than historical earnings that we are budgeting for next year. We will likely have to pull a combination of levers, cost control, focus on highly higher complexity services that are unique to an academic health center, and sustain volume growth, all of which will in turn require capital and physical capacity. Next slide. A year ago, I told the board that we are learning more each week. That remains true. By tightening first to loosen later, OHSU has navigated the changing course of the virus and of the economy. The budget here pro um, proposed targets 7.5% top line growth to nearly $3.9 billion, significant new and refilled positions, a 1% operating margin consistent with planning over the past six months, with investment in equipment, facilities, technology, to allow our 3,000 faculty, 15,000 staff, and 4,000 learners to do their best work. FY22 represents a year of regrouping and rebuilding after the disruption and exhaustion of pandemic, when hiring, spending, travel, and capital were all held back. Following wide ranging discussion at the university and at the Finance and Audit Committee, I now bring the proposed budget for your consideration. I'm pleased to answer any questions. Uh, the first question is from Mr. Zika. Uh, thank you. Uh, great presentation, and I appreciate the the efforts by the whole OHSU team to manage during a difficult period. And I think you've summarized the, the challenges pretty good there. I would comment that I, I still believe the budget for next year is pretty conservative. I, I think we'll beat that. I know you have some items that uh, uh, you may believe also that we're gonna do better than that. But I, I do believe it's appropriate to be conservative. We have been conservative and there's still COVID-19 out there. You know we all are celebrating that we're improving, but there's still a lot of uncertainty. So I support keeping a conservative budget, uh, but I would challenge the team going forward. I think it was the last item on your uh, last slide about um, we have to address the gap. Um, the revenue is growing pretty substantially and the costs are growing way, way over inflation. And maybe inflation is changing now. I hope. I hope not. We're, we're not going back to the 70s, but uh, whether that's through Accelerate or shared services, um, and if we're going to achieve our mission, be able to add capacity, be able to pay people appropriate, we've got to get those margins back up, at least closer to the old margins to succeed. So thank you for your effort, and, uh, and I, I support the budget. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Um, my comment would be commending the university community. As you pointed in your conclusion, um, we're learning and we learned from, through the pandemic, but we tightened first and loosened later. The tightening was difficult. And I wanna commend the university community for participating uh, in that tightening. And it was hard for everyone. And we, as a board, we wanna recognize that, uh, but we think we're in a good place to move forward uh, for what we've learned. And to Steve's point, we, we do need to get the margins back to where they were, but I don't want to discount the fact that it was tough tightening over the early part of this. And um, we seem to be in a good, strong place coming out of it. So thanks to all the community for what they did to, to keep us going. Any other comment from board members? Uh, Ms. Chamberlain has a question. Sorry, I was trying to find the raise hand function and I couldn't find it. So uh, thank you, uh, Chair Monfries. Uh, thank you, Lawrence, for the presentation. I just had a couple questions when I was looking over the board materials. Uh, the faculty senate raised some issues uh, involving equity. 
uh, with regard to the faculty salaries and that while this proposal looks to increase that um, by 3%, it looked like uh, they were thinking that 5% was necessary in order to make sure that these uh, salaries were in alignment. And I'm specifically interested in that because you had mentioned early on that, you know, this budget's really built on an investment in, in workers and, and especially with regard to these salaries, it looks like it has a, um, an equity aspect to it um, because predominantly this would uh, align more women and BIPOC folks uh, to make sure that their salaries were, were in alignment. So I'm just wondering if you could address that. Um, uh, thank you for that question. Um, Included in the budget and included within that 3% pool for um, uh, for faculty, the same is true for other um, uh, staff under Oregon Pay Equity, uh, are the funds to make all of the salary equity adjustments that we've identified. Uh, for the faculty, we had an outside firm, Willis Tower Watson, do an extensive analysis. Um, and we had used an internal process, but a very similar process for the supervisory and management staff. So those are all included in the budget. The second issue, and what that allows us to do is make sure that internal to OHSU, salaries are equitable relative to the, the relevant uh, criteria, and we are not underpaying women, BIPOC, faculty, et cetera. Um, the second issue then are our, are our salaries market competitive? That's the outside comparison, not the inside comparison. And there, I think there is evidence that both on the uh, supervisory and management staff and on the faculty that we have some work to do. Um, and it may take more than a single year's budget in order to bring us up to a market uh, comparison equity there and so I, I do um, I want to make that distinction between the two of them. The internal equity ones uh, we have budgeted. We have some money that we will um, have left over if you will or uh, within this budget to make market adjustments as well um, but it may be a multi-year process. How we have put this together just to give a sense of this is we have also moved um, as we speak we're moving from 47 separate uh, faculty compensation plans to one overarching structure across the university. We're the first time we have um, comprehensive data as to what we pay our faculty for what effort. Um, and it took us well over a year, our outside consultants well over a year to develop that data when we did the uh, equity uh, study, the, the WTW one I just mentioned. Going forward, we'll be able to track that much more carefully. We're going to take a process in July, August, and September to look at that new data, see where there are differences that are finer grained uh, than, than the larger study, the first study was done, and also more importantly, looking at the outside market issue. And then we hope to be able to release further funds to address, address that. I hope that helps uh, understand the, the difference between the two pieces. Yes, uh, Lawrence, Chairman, Murphy, is a follow-up question? Yes. Yeah. Sure. Um, thanks. Um, so I, I appreciate the, the internal analysis was done, but I'm really concerned if there was uh, disparities that we saw with an external analysis, right? Because that actually shows um, sort of a bigger picture of what may be going on. And my concern is, is that, is it that we don't have the funding in order to make these adjustments that are necessary for equity to happen now, or why, why delay it? Because I, I am concerned with any type of delay that, that may be unnecessary if we know what the numbers need to be uh, to make sure that we're being market equitable across the board. Um, well, we're being equitable. We, we have budgeted enough to, to address all the equity issues across the faculty. Then the next question is how much resources do we have to bring that now equitable level up to a market comparison um, piece, which is a moving target that we are we are actually collecting data on now. Um, uh, so I would hope that we would be able to come back uh, to the board and um, and get a much better sense of what that gap, if any, is. And uh, but um, I'm I just want to be very comp very clear that we have included the 
equity across the faculty in this. Uh, it's a question of, of over what period of time can we, uh, you know, meet a uh, median uh, across uh, other universities. Thanks for your answer, Lawrence, and, and I appreciate, I really appreciate the, the response. And when I say equity, uh, I appreciate that you're, you're talking about internal to OHSU, yeah. but, and I, I understand the distinction with a, a market analysis. I'm just merely flagging that sometimes those are equity issues as well, and I yeah. want to make sure that we're not delaying uh, make, getting this work done. Yeah. It looked like the, the research was already there and that we were, that we just didn't want to spend the money. So if that's not the case, then um, I uh, uh, Yeah, I, I would say that um, we have spent the, all the money on the first piece of research. We are now collecting data, literally as we speak, um, that will show um, every faculty member's salary compared to an external benchmark that's relevant for that faculty. And it's really the very first time we have that data across the university in a consistent way. Um, and that's the work of the next year. Let me second that. I, 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 thank you for the question. I think that part is critically important. When you look at external comparisons, it's the kind of deep dive we're doing now, engaging the faculty to make sure we're precise. There's a great debate about what should be the appropriate reference benchmark. So we need to have that discussion internally because AAMC, MGMA, and practice solutions all have averages that are out there. Institutions report that data differently, which is why we have to have the faculty centers and others engaged because what is actually reported that generates those benchmarks actually varies dramatically by institutions. But I think the other thing is in some cases, um, you know, we have unique specialists and unique uh, providers such that the broad strokes from a double AMC may not be relevant or applicable because we only have a one person or two person specialty group. I'd like to say that we are certainly leaning in on all that. I think it is great as Lawrence mentioned that we now have a system that will allow us to look at that activity and duties by mission, which means we can get at those issues of making further adjustments, especially if uh, the year uh, goes better than imagined where you and Mr. Zeke and others have talked about opportunities to uh, control our expenses and be more efficient while we work on revenue. Thank you for that robust uh, discussion. I don't, I don't want to get too far off of the budget conversation. So I'm going to now turn it to Dr. Andreessen to present the academic tuition and fee book. Thank you, Chair Mumphreys. Um, well, it's a pleasure to be with you and, and you've heard some of the reasons that this is a, a good year, my last year for presenting the tuition and fee book um, to um, talk about um, wh what the process was and, and where we are for our proposal this year. Um, I'm joined by Dr. David Robinson, who will who is always with us at these meetings, but um, who will be the interim executive vice president and provost July 1st. We've already started uh, transitioning a lot of the work that we do, um, where we've I've had the the most extraordinary, uh, seamless team um, to work with uh, that I started to work with before I was in this position. Um, so it's it's hard to leave OHSU, but I will say that I have been married to one of the most patient spouses um, in the country, and uh, he is looking forward to my being fully retired. Uh, we have a lot of stored up things after 38 years of marriage. So um, I really, I, I'll never be gone from OHSU, and I'm always available, and I get to keep my email. Um, this year, we are in much better shape to be planning. Um, we could uh, we could actually stay at the last. I wanted to give an overview without getting stuck on uh, on uh, uh, tables that uh, we'll uh, describe briefly. Last year, as you remember, we had the financial uh, deficit expected for the university. The state was uh, going to make large cuts in the kind of general funding. And um, and other kind of funding that we use to support the education mission um, that helps keep tuition low. So we had set tuition increases um, between five and uh, percent and seven and a half percent, depending on how dependent programs were um, on uh, state money. Um, but 
the state came through and I want to acknowledge again this year, as we did last year, that the students talking to elected officials had a very large impact, I believe, on students being listened to throughout Oregon. Um, so we were able to keep the tuition increase at 2%. And when we thought we were going to have to uh, disband the tuition promise that holds things for some programs equal across the program uh, with no tuition raises for some programs, we were able to reinstate that as well in the President's uh, Scholar Program. So this year we're able to start with a better prediction. Uh, we're in much better shape with the uh, um, uh, funds that the state is giving us um, and the university is in uh, strong stead. So we're able to keep the overall uh, tuition increase to 2%. Our costs go up more than that, but the university has the ability uh, to help us uh, to balance that. So that's extremely good news for us this year. The only real difference from um, uh, last year is that the tuition portion, uh, the, the fee portion, um, that is the university fee is uh, uh, stable this year, is not an increase over last year. Uh, we often don't increase that, but we haven't increased that this year. Um, so the that is all really good news. And if we can now go to the next slide, I'll, I'll talk briefly about just an example of what that looks like. So this is just um, a, a sample of what uh, will happen for the um, entering classes um, and those increases uh, for a select number of them. Um, they vary from um, under 2% to 2% at the top because as we look at what a 2% increase is, we do have to, we, we want to hit that, you know, dollar amount, not cents on the end of it. Um, but you can see across uh, some of these major programs that we've been able to keep the tuition increase uh, as, as low as uh, possible. Um, that's, a, I think, really good news um, and isn't it wasn't possible at some other kinds of uh, health science centers. Next slide. So this is a more um, uh, uh, detailed view that helps look at the tuition promise programs and give you some insight um, into uh, what happens. So you can see for MD programs, uh, dentist programs, um, and others that are in the top part of this chart, um, their uh, tuition was set when they came into the program and it stays the same for the rest of their program um, with the tuition promise. So the percent increase for those returning students in programs that have the tuition promise is 0% um, increase. That is one of the programs we've been able to offer that has decreased the increase, if you will, and started to stabilize some of the tuition for um, programs that we've been able to um, have that in. Um, so this is an um, example for uh, students who are coming in on the bottom part um, from many of those programs. Their tuition is about 2% higher, but then because they're in the tuition pro, um, promise program, it will not go up for the rest of uh, their programs. Next uh, slide. Um, and this is um, from the non-tuition uh, promise programs, just um, a, a, a reiteration that they come in as 2% higher and then are dependent on um, how low we can keep tuition increases in the future. In the last two um, academic years, we have used a tuition increase that is across the board for the university. Um, and there may be differences in programs that can keep it lower or need uh, more increases in the coming year. We really won't know till we get just a little bit further along. So um, the tuition and fee book, which follows uh, these brief example uh, tables are, is very complete. Um, and um, Vice Provost Sherry Honnell and her team have always put together exceptional definitions and the uh, details that are there. Most questions that you might have are in there, but uh, both uh, David Robinson and I would be glad to uh, provide more information. The tuition promise may be of special interest. That um, uh, aspect of the book starts on pages uh, 99 and goes to page 101. Um, and there's an in-depth report that really talks about um, different fees and so forth, and different programs have different fees for the components that go into teaching that are different um, across programs. Um, but that's where I'll summarize and, and look forward to your questions.
Thank you, Dr. Andreessen. Um, any questions from board members? See any? Um, I don't have any uh, comment of, of the commitment to, to try to keep the, the tuition uh, stable for the students. So uh, thank you for the work that the team has done there and, and being reasonable in, in that. Um, with that, um, we'll thank you for the presentation and we will turn it to Dr. Eden for the faculty Senate response to the budget. Good afternoon. I'm Karen Eden, um, the Senate president, and I bring you greetings from the OHSU faculty Senate. Thank you for your service um, to the to OHSU and meeting with the senators through virtual meetings to discuss priorities for the Senate. We've greatly appreciated those dialogues over the year. In this talk, we respond to the planned budget for fiscal year 22. Next slide. The mission of the Senate is to represent and serve the faculty of OHSU to create, maintain, and protect an academic environment of scholarly learning, teaching, research, patient care, and community service. Next slide. As a Senate, we propose, evaluate, and advise on policies and activities with OHSU-wide impact or affecting any school or union. We provide feedback on those decisions from the perspective of the Senate and the OHSU faculty. Next slide. So we want to first of all acknowledge the new development funds for faculty. The Senate appreciates the five million allocated to address the needs of faculty to develop, their careers and support research programs. For example, a faculty member may want to seek a leadership training or may need some equipment for their lab. This is a great opportunity for faculty and, and we want to, to express our appreciation. Um, we do ask for transparency and equity in the application and the selection process. And I was pleased today that I was actually um, contacted by the president's office to give some feedback on the messaging that's going out. So I appreciate that. So next slide. The Senate greatly appreciates OHSU leadership's effort to make salaries equitable to all faculty members internally and comparable to published salary tables. This is an important investment in faculty that will help us attract and retain a diverse faculty. It will also help us prepare for the next phase post-COVID. We recognize there's financial constraints on the fiscal year 22 budget due to COVID-19, which limits the pool of money available to make all needed adjustments by October 21. The budget currently plans for an average of a 3% increase per faculty member, but this pool must cover equity adjustments and promotions. The current estimate is that more than 5% per faculty member should be allocated to fully adjust those in need and bring salaries up to published salary tables. These adjustments should address rank, assistant professor, associate professor, and professor, and importantly, time and rank to allow faculty members to move toward the median within a rank. The current and also the current allotment includes no merit increases. While faculty members will see a salary, while some faculty members will see a salary increase in October, many faculty members will see no change in salary for the second consecutive year and fall further behind market comparison. By comparison, our represented colleagues received raises in fiscal year 21 and will again in fiscal year 22. Over the past few years, faculty trust in OHSU leadership uh, to recognize their value has eroded. Allocating more funds to invest in faculty salaries is one me mechanism to rebuild trust and recognize incredible efforts the faculty have made over the past 18 months. And finally, we heard today that we're forecasting a 7.5% growth. It is time to make faculty salaries competitive with market comparisons. Next slide. We have two requests. Increase the pool allotted for faculty salary increases to make all needed adjustments with, with consideration for rank and years in rank. This is these equity Note, for equity, these adjustments are particularly important for women and underrepresented faculty who often remain as assistant and associate professors. 
which partially explains the salary gap that we, was noted by WTW. How do we afford this? We could reduce or delay some, just some of the fiscal year 22 capital spending. Instead of spending 190 million, a 40% increase over fiscal year 21, budget fiscal year 22 for a 30% increase or 175 million. Use any incremental organizational revenues over the budgeted amount to make much needed salary adjustments to our valued faculty member, even members, even if it's mid-year. And finally, should state appropriations be better than expected, please reallocate funds to prioritize our people first and appropriately adjust faculty salaries so they're competitive with market. Finally, the Senate requests a transparent process and timely communication when adjusting salaries or providing merit increases. Um, next slide. I want to close by acknowledging some incredible service from two of our leaders. Dr. Derek DeBouvier joined OHSU in 2014. He served the Faculty Senate from 2015 to present in the roles of School of Medicine Unit A Senator, Senate President, and immediate past president, and also served on numerous Senate and University Councils and committees. We are grateful for his continued dedication and support of the faculty and the OHSU community. We wish him great success in all his endeavors as the OHSU Senior Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Dr. Rose McFarland joined OHSU faculty in 2006 and served on the faculty twice, 2006 through 2012, and again 2015 until very recently. Dr. McFarland just left OHSU to become the Chair of Clinical Services at the U University of Nevada, Las Vegas. We are grateful for the wise insights Dr. McFarland brought to Senate and wish great success in this new leadership role. Next slide. So my time as Senate President completes this month. I am pleased to announce the Senate President-elect as Dr. Martina Rao. She will begin her two-year term in July 1. Dr. Martina Rao is a PhD, she has been a senator since 2018 and an executive committee member since 2019. Dr. Rao has been a member of the OHSU community since 1996. She is an associate professor in the Department of Molecular and Medical Genetics and the director of the Elemental Analysis Corps, a shared university resource. In her role as senator and a member of the executive committee, Dr. Rao is co-chairing the Faculty Rights and Responsibilities Workgroup and serves on the pay gap Task Force, as well as the Data Governance Steering Committee. So welcome to Dr. To Rao. And next slide. Thank you. And this time I'm available for questions and also by email. Well, thank you, Dr. Eden. I will say uh, from the board, we wanna thank you for your service as the Faculty Senate President, um, your participation in the the management and oversight of uh, OHSU. So uh, thank you for that. Um, and we too, as a board, enjoy the um, interaction with the faculty Senate leadership um, to discuss your concerns and, and take that into account. We always, we, we wanna listen and uh, make sure we take those perspectives into account as we weigh things like the budget and the fee book. Um, that said, um, there is one comment from Ms. Chamberlain. can't see you, but you must be on the Yeah, I would like to make a motion uh, that we adopt the uh, faculty sentence recommendations. There's a, mo a motion. Is there a second? Can I speak to my motion? Um, there, uh, there's a motion, no second. Uh, Very briefly. Perhaps you can speak to a comment, but the, the, the motion hasn't moved. All right. Um, well, the reason I make the recommendation is I greatly appreciate the faculty Senate taking the time to put together the presentation, to look over all the information, and to give us recommendations. And uh, to hear that some folks are not going to get a wage adjustment for two years in a row seems. Uh, doesn't seem right. Uh, cost of living adjustment uh, goes up every year. 
Um, and so, you know, they make these recommendations and we thank them for them, but uh, I'm wondering at what point do we deliberate about them and do we consider them as part of the budget? And if it's not here, is there another process to do that? So I, I, I don't disagree that uh, the faculty senate makes their recommendations and as a board, we take them into account. Um, they're here to be discussed within the motion of the the budget adoption, uh, as well as discussed in the finance committee. Um, so I, I think that they're all well known. I think there's a, a lot of discussion on either side of those arguments. Um, and I think that there's different perspectives and those do come out in the discussion that we will have when we go to the motion of the adoption of the budget um, within the process. So uh, Thank you, Chair. I think um, we can move forward to Mr. Zika's comment. Yeah, I uh, similar to what I said earlier, I mean, you're facing a lot of choices in a very difficult year with uncertainty. And so I am pretty confident after the discussion in the finance committee and what I've heard from some of the officers is they are trying to balance those priorities. Having said that, last year we adopted a conservative or adjusted conservative balance given or budget knowing what was going on and then as results came in a little bit better still way below historical levels we were able to make some adjustments so what i would recommend is we continue with the budget as proposed but monitor it throughout the year and if we do better then whether it's this adjustment or a different adjustment um, we, we can make some adjustments during the year based on the performance. So that, that would be my recommendation. Yeah. And I, and I'd say that, I, you know, I think that, um, we, as a board commended the faculty for their commitment, uh, during the beginning of the pandemic to take cuts. Um, and I think we've also commended the, the institution for going back and, uh, reinstating salaries retroactively. So I, I think that we've there there's partnership that's been shown uh, with with everyone, which is goes to my original comments of the community participating in this challenging time. Um, and when we look at the results and we see growth of 7% plus, um, but 7% plus on a really small number because the pandemic impacted us shows that we're just on on the way to getting back, but there are certainly discussions that everyone's um, taking. And I, and I think that it's an ongoing discussion with regard to the trust of the faculty uh, from the administration. And that's something that as a board, we will monitor and push to make sure that the entire uni uh, university community is on the same page. So we certainly hear those comments and we'll continue to push forward and monitor that. Um, Dr. Jacobs has a comment. Yes, thank you, Chairman Fries. And, um, you know, uh, I think the suggestion that Mr. Zika put forth uh, is uh, appropriate. We will continue to monitor uh, regularly, if not every week, every other week, our financial performance. I think the opportunity to get back in front of the board in September and update on financial performance, where the first call on the dollar, in my view, should be to address uh, faculty compensation with the caveats I mentioned earlier about us having internal reference standard involving the Senate and others as to what is the appropriate benchmark. And one of the important things that needs to occur is, and I and, and, and Dr. Eden and I have had many conversations, a decision point for the university would be, it's not just this material impact if you were to do compensation on capital expenditures in FY22. If we do that, we'd have to talk about sustainability in the out years as well. That's a decision that we can certainly make. And that's what we're trying to tee up first by having the first ever system to be able to track um, activity uh, in a unified manner across all faculty and all the schools. But the second recommendation, you know, we have every uh, intention of making sure the process is transparent and open. Uh, and so we can certainly address that. In terms of how those decisions be made, that's something where I'd expect we'll have the faculty senators and others uh, and there's uh, so everyone should be reassured that there won't be some uh, arcane methodology or otherwise an appropriate methodology to decide which projects the faculty recommend are those that are supported or those that will be supported. Thank you. Um, any other comments? 
So now go to a resolution number 2021-06-04, which is the adoption of the operating budget, capital budget, academic year, tuition and fees, and health system budgets. Um, is there a motion to approve the those items? So move. This is Ruth Byer. Is there a second? I'll second. This is Steve. Any questions or comments? Hearing none, we will take a roll on this, um, Ms. Seeley. All right. Director Byer. Aye. Director Zika. Aye. Director Paulson. Aye. Oh. Director. Excuse. Pardon? No. Oh, pa Paulson. Paulson. Yes. Paulson. Yes. Paulson. P. P. Aye. Uh, Director Carlson. Aye. Director Chamberlain. Aye. Director Dubé. Aye. President Jacobs. Aye. And Chair Mumphreys. Aye. Thank you. Uh, we also have resolution number 2021-06-05, and this is the reappointment of KPMG as the public accounting firm for audit services. Um, I will take a voice. Uh, well, we'll have a motion. So moved, Chad Paulson. Second. I'll second this, Steve. Any questions or comments or discussion? Seeing none, we'll take a voice vote on this, Ms. Seeley. Director Byer. Aye. Director Zika. Aye. Director Director Paulson with the P. Aye. Director Dubé. Aye. Director Chamberlain. Aye. Thank you. Director Carl Carlson with the C. Aye. Uh, President Jacobs. Aye. And Chair Monfries. Aye. Thank you. Uh, that resolution is also passed. We are now ahead. And so we will continue to stay ahead. Um, we're going to take our 20 minute break now. Um, we won't go. We won't, the 20 minutes will take us to say five past the hour which is a 10 minutes uh, before um, the scheduled uh, end of the break, but I think that we'd rather go faster and end earlier if we do, or at least have more time for discussion if something comes up in the second half of the meeting. So we will take a adjournment for now and come back at five past uh, one. Thanks everyone.
We're live. Well, welcome back, everyone. Uh, we will continue with the board meeting with the OHSU 2025 update, and we're going to begin with a video presentation from Ms. Bridget Barnes. Hello, I'm Bridget Barnes, Chief Information Officer at OHSU. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity of sharing with you all virtually today the work of OHSU 2025 Refresh Team. We engaged over 100 OHSU members in the refresh process, and several members of our team committed substantial time to ensure that we identified the most pressing priorities for OHSU in the year to come. I am especially grateful to our council, co-chairs, and support staff, and you can find a list of those individuals in, in the appendix slides of this presentation. So let's begin with our agenda. We'll begin with the why and what, and then we'll move to closing with our recommendations, which were presented to the University Cabinet and ultimately Dr. Jacobs. So let's begin with the why. In February of 2021, Dr. Jacobs asked us to refresh our OHSU 2025 strategic plan. We needed to do this to align our priorities with our current environment. Our finances have changed. The pandemic has influenced influence changes across the organization. We aspire to become an anti-racist organization and we need to ensure a safe and welcoming environment for all. So how did we go about that? We began with the review of the OHSU 2025 baseline objectives. We reviewed the outcomes from the University Cabinet Study Group work that happened at the end of calendar year 20. We reviewed the original objectives through a post-COVID lens and proposed new objectives for consideration given the changed environment. We then identified interdependencies across mission areas, prioritized objectives for consideration, and recommended our, our plan to the OHSU Budget Committee and the University Cabinet. So here's a little bit more about the process. We began by reestablishing our mission-based councils. We then asked those councils to define objectives, revisiting those existing objectives and identifying new objectives. We then asked them to gather data related to those objectives and tactics to make sure that we had appropriate financial support to move those objectives forward. Finally, we identified a number of overlaps or interdependencies, and we needed to decide whether or not we were going to manage those inside or outside of the OHSU 2025 process. We then prioritized the objectives both within our mission-based councils and across all councils and formed a recommendation for FY22 funding. So here's the result of that first tranche of work. I would ask you to begin by noting the key in the upper right hand corner that identifies a color code associated with each mission based council. Next, I would ask you to notice the asterisks that are identified in some of the objectives. These asterisks represent objectives that had pre approved OHSU 2025 funding moving forward into FY22. Finally, I'd ask you to take a look at the bottom right hand corner where you will see a number of new objectives, most of those uh, resulting out of the work of the Infrastructure Council, but one resulting from the work of our interdependencies. So let's talk about those interdependencies for a moment. Uh, OHSU is nothing if not complex, and we identified a number of issues that landed outside of our traditional mission based council structure. These are those issues. I'm going to be, speak to them briefly, beginning at the top with faculty compensation. We will be addressing this objective outside of the OHSU 2025 process. Moving to the right, we combined the well-being and workload objectives into a single objective that was advanced to the OHSU 2025 process. In addition, we continued work with the health system wellness sprints that began in fiscal year 21. Moving down to the five o'clock position, mentorship. We have a number of independent teams that are working on a path forward. Moving further to the left, we identify graduate medical education as an objective worthy of discussion. This will be addressed outside of the OHSU 2025 process. Further to the left, at nearly the nine o'clock position, you will notice the, the clinical research. We identified a specific objective related to clinical research, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later in this presentation. Finally, at the 10 o'clock position, you'll note training gap. This may be addressed outside of the OHSU 2025 process, but it was also included in our research funding objective. 
So here's where we landed, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time walking through um, the specifics of this slide. If we begin, um, as expected, we had a number of good ideas and had to make deliberate choices about how we would move forward um, with those critical with the critical work. I'm going to begin on the left hand column. These are objectives that had dedicated OHSU 2025 funding. Beginning with simulation, um, objective number 2.2, you will note that uh, it may not be a surprise to you that simulation became a critical competency uh, during the pandemic. This objective allows us to expand the capabilities of simulation, not only at our Portland campus, but also at schools of nursing across the state. Next, I call your attention to research informatics at 4.3. The research informatics objective provides support for our high performance computing for OHSU researchers, as well as improvements to our research data warehouse that will enable research on new data elements such as social determinants of health. At the bottom of the list, you'll notice a new objective, flexible workspace. This objective will provide needed capabilities to support the continuation of distributed work that we adopted as a result of, of the pandemic. I'm gonna move now to our middle column. These are objectives that we identified additional funding sources for outside of the OHSU 25, 2025 dedicated funding. Beginning with support for our aspirational goal of becoming an anti-racism racist organization, I would highlight 1.9 environment of respect, trust, and empowerment, 1.10 diversity, equity, and inclusion training, 1.12.2 our confident confidential advocate program, and you'll notice a new objective related to the increasing the diversity of our supply chain. Finally, I would call your attention to well-being 1.11. We this objective will help us help us sustain and enhance the systems that we put in place during the pandemic to support the OHSU members' personal well-being and resiliency. Finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the objectives in the column on our right-hand side. While we did not receive the requested for level of funding for these objectives, we will be able to move forward with a number of these objectives from other alternative OHSU funding sources. I'm going to begin with those in the healthcare mission. Beginning with our cancer service line, we will use FY22 capital funding to expand our cellular therapy lab, to expand our community oncology infusion clinic at Mount Hood, Moving down to our women and children's service line, again, FY22 capital funding will be used to create and enhance our fetal therapy program. And finally, our neuroservice line at 3.8 will receive FY22 capital funding to support incisionless surgery. Next, I'd like to highlight uh, one of the new objectives, the clinical research interdependency. Again, while we did not receive the funding that we had hoped, we will be able to continue to move forward with this objective based on funding allocation from our chief research officer's office. We will extend our research capabilities to OHSU Health Partners at both Hillsborough Medical Center and Adventist. Finally, if we do better than budget, we may be able to fund more of these objectives in the future. We'll continue to monitor our progress against our budget targets throughout the year. So what's next? Next, we will begin initiation of projects. We will then update our OHSU 2025 materials for key stakeholders, both inside and outside of OHSU. We will implement our OHSU performance management program, providing quarterly updates so that we can um, identify um, how, our, how our programs of work are doing and provide support if necessary to continue moving them forward. And finally, we will provide our first performance dashboard to the OHSU Board of Directors in January of 22. Thank you again for allowing me the opportunity to share this work with you. I'm going to hand it off to Connie Seeley, our Chief of Staff, and Wayne Shields, Director of OHSU's Program Management Office, to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, well, thank the team for all of that. Um, I, I'll turn it to Ms. Seely for any comments that she wants to start with. I don't know that I necessarily have any comments. Um, a huge amount of work, huge kudos to Bridget, to Wayne Moline and the team for, and frankly, the councils who have invested hours of time. So in, the, in your appendices, you'll see those councils. And those folks have, and this is above their COVID work and other work that has happened in the last year, 
who've invested hours in uh, refreshing uh, the 2025 plan that you all received two-ish years ago. And with that, Wayne, Malene, and I are happy to answer any additional questions. So I, I, I don't know that I caught in the dialogue how, I mean, there was a huge undertaking to um, engage the entire university community um, to get to the original um, things that we wanted to get done. Um, now we've refreshed it and we've kind of taken some new decisions based on some things that have occurred. How has the community been, been engaged to make sure that these things are still the top priorities that uh, they'd like to see addressed? That's a great question. I'll jump. I'll jump in. Um, I think. I think the one caveat I would put out is that um, this was a, a refresh to take a list. We had. Uh, re we didn't have as many resources as we once did. We had put our uh, flag in the ground and on our journey to become an anti-racist organization. And as we move through COVID, uh, you know, we had to ask ourselves what kind of, what's different now than two years ago. So, so that is all to say that we have not done the crowdsourcing component. We will go back to that when we do a whole new plan, but we, this wasn't to completely de deviate from the original 2025 rather to look at it through those lenses that I just mentioned. Um, and again, with the pressure of diminished resources, figure out what really, what still needed to continue and what we could potentially pause on or try to find some other means to fund. So short answer is we have not crowdsourced as you, re as you remember um, in the last go around, um, but the councils that were deeply involved in prioritizing all of that crowdsourcing work were very much involved and invested quite a bit of time. Yeah, no, that's, that's fair. I didn't, I didn't, wouldn't have expected we reset, re crowdsource or start all over again. I just, I, I want to make sure that the community realizes it's not just a, a small group of people that selected, hey, this is what we're going to do and we're not going to do the other stuff. So um, just making sure there was all engagement. So that was helpful. Uh, Mr. Dubai has a question. Yeah, and uh, the slides went by very quickly. So I want to make sure I read it right. Uh, when uh, Bridget was speaking from wherever she is, um, did did she say that uh, DEI and anti-racism are unfunded? They're they're funded. Do you, Wayne, do you want to give give uh, Director Dubai the detail? This is Wayne Shields, who's the director of of our Enterprise Project Management Office, who's been instrumental. Oh, in gotcha. Mo so, moving uh, us through this. Yeah, sure. So the uh, DEI um, training initiative, the uh, respect, uh, trust and empowerment objective and supplier diversity are all funded through um, additional anti-racism funds that were allocated um, by OHSU rather than through the um, original OHSU 2025 allocation. In other words, Prashant, we, uh, uh, Director Dubai, we, Dubai, we added funds uh, on a separate stream rather than have it compete against the other initiatives. Yeah. Oh, okay. So it is funded, yeah. but through a different it is funded. stream. Yes. Yes. Uh, okay. And and I'll probably bring this up when uh, Dr. Duvivier speaks, uh, if he is going to speak, I'm not sure. But um, it's about a broader DEI focus and wanted to make sure that I know that anti-racism is definitely a focus, but uh, it's important to also consider things like disability inclusion, which are often a footnote when it comes to DEI. Uh, and I'd love to hear how that would be addressed in our DEI efforts writ large. Thank you for that. Um, I think I, I will largely let Dr. Duvivier speak to that. Um, our our Given that I don't directly have my hands on these on these initiatives, I, I don't want to uh, say the wrong thing to you, um, but they are still prioritized, and I think I think you're you're spot on in accessibility and in the context as we move through COVID and a pandemic. What does that mean? Thanks. I, I, one thing I don't recall seeing in the presentation is timing, and I'm assuming all of these have different timing but um what what give us a range of how quickly we're trying to get these things done 
they it, well they range you're going to see our, our for for the board what i was just you know let wayne um jump in on the most specifics on the timing but what i would suggest for the board is we'll be back in january we're putting kind of setting that that um goal out there with the first dashboard which will include specific deliverables and timelines but but wayne do you want to give kind of a, a ballpark in terms of how many are or multi-year versus shorter timelines? Yeah, I'm not sure I have that level of detail. We focused on FY22 specifically. So all of the objectives have um, had articulated a three-year um, timeline in terms of funding, um, but the intent is to revisit um, every quarter to make sure that the objectives are progressing effectively. Um, but right now the time horizon for all of these is, is a three-year period. So I, I think we we had dashboards that we used a couple of years ago um, to met to have the metrics uh, as you put together these things over a three year timeline. Regardless of what the end point is, it could be a five year or a ten year end point. It could be a one year end point. As we put together those dashboards, we'd like to see the timeline so that as we measure them and we get together, we can see how we're progressing along that and making sure things don't aren't falling off. Yep, absolutely. I think, uh, Dr. Thank you. Dr. Andreessen had a comment. I just wanted to add to um, uh, our member Dubé that we have um, a long standing funded program from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention at OHSU. It's the main thing that brought me to OHSU. Um, it's the Oregon Office on Disability and Health. There are state projects. Um, and programs for public health and things like access and uh, healthy disability. Um, so we have a, a, a small, very competent group uh, that also works with the university among other um, aspects. Um, and just wanted to say that we have that kind of resource and they're uh, fairly active. They're, they're not a, you know, directed toward the university kind of a group. They're a statewide, more public health um, uh, activity. Uh, but uh, we have one of the top ones and the longest living in the entire United States. So we've, we've got some really good people, um, possibly that you might enjoy talking with. <clears throat> Thank you. I'd appreciate an introduction. Great. Um, seeing no other comments or questions in the chat, um, we will thank the team for the presentation. Uh, we look forward to the dashboards and continuing to track the progress here. We, we all know that the pandemic threw a bump in the 2025 strategic plan, but as we talked about at the beginning of the meeting, we're trying to get back to where we were both financially, uh, but also in the activities that we're undertaking to continue to evolve the institution. So thank you all for the work. And much like with the finances, it takes the whole university community to contribute to this. So we look forward to hearing the results and the progress. So thank you all. Uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it to Dr. DeVivier for an update on the uh, DE&I um, activities and anti-racism activities. Dr. DeVivier. Great, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Monfries and members of the board. Thank you for the opportunity to provide an update on equity, inclusion, and anti-racism work at OHSU. Over the past three months, OHSU has continued to advance on its aspirational, intentional journey of organizational transformation. We have continued to promote anti-racism and multiculturalism within the organization and in the region. This work continues to follow a multi-pronged strategy predicated on the centrality of anti-racism and equity in the educational research and healthcare missions. Multiple stakeholders across the institution continue to advance our core values while increasing capacity for sustained organizational change. First slide, please. This diagram demonstrates the multi-pronged strategy to advance anti-racism work at OHSU. We're working at the individual and systemic levels. This work is further subdivided into the individual, interpersonal, institutional, and structural categories and their intersections. Next slide, please. At the structural level, OHSU members have participated in state advocacy efforts in support of Bill 398, which makes the display of a news a criminal offense. I am pleased to announce that this bill was passed and has become law. With regard to COVID-19 and the disproportionate burden of disease in communities of color, 
The OHSG Vaccine Equity Committee has been extremely active, and you will hear from Dr. Don Spite on these efforts. In addition to the vaccination program, there have been efforts to provide education around the virus and vaccine. To that end, I have participated in a question and answer session with members of the Africa House and have updated the Oregon Commission on Black Affairs. And Dr. Jacobs and I continue to participate on the State Racial Justice Council. Next slide, please. On another note, uh, before I proceed to this slide, I wanna say that it is unfortunate that the legislature was unable to pass Bill 2337, which declared that racism is a public health crisis. Despite this temporary setback, we acknowledge that racism is a public health crisis and will continue with our anti-racism efforts. To this slide. The CDI has continued its support of employees through its support of the Employee Resource Group. This has included support of the OHSU Pride Month through support of the virtual bingo event, as well as Juneteenth commemoration. This is a recognized university holiday, and we supported a week-long um, series of events commemorating and educating around Juneteenth. I would also like to report that Human Resources is continuing to advance its anti-racism plan and is actively engaging stakeholders throughout the university, including the employee resource groups. Next slide, please. This is a, a flyer from the OHSU uh, Juneteenth week. It was a Sankofa series. See uh, a number of events that occurred. Uh, this uh, series was well received by participants and attendees. Next slide, please. We continue, we continue to support anti-racism and equity, education and action. The Provost Search Committee is now operating with the presence of a search advocate. I am functioning in that capacity. The first time there's been a search advocate on a search committee at the university. I have advised the co-chairs on ways to improve equity in the search process and mitigate bias. This has included changes to the position description wording, uh, uh, commentary on interview questions and process, as well as increasing the uh, market for advertisement of position in order to uh, advertise, get a greater uh, presence in communities of color. We have completed our first cohort of participants in the train the trainer session of the stepping in, creating a culture of respect and inclusion, um, inclusion collaboration program. We are reviewing feedback, modifying where possible and planning for a second cohort and then university wide enrollment. I'm pleased to announce that we are poised to welcome a record 33 equity interns at the university, both physically and virtually. Uh, last year, I believe our numbers were about 26, 27. So we've greatly expanded this program. Uh, also at graduation, we were honored, uh, graduates were honored for excellence in diversity equity inclusion work with the awarding of diversity honor cords. We are continuing with our implicit bias education series, including implicit bias for hiring managers. The establishment of a policy stating that as of July 1st, hiring managers cannot post jobs unless they have completed the implicit bias for hiring managers course has led to an acute uptick in participants over the last six weeks. Our courses have been filled with no openings despite additional offerings. With stakeholder input, we have completed design of anti-racism signs for distribution and display across the university. We are currently working on the logistics of printing and hanging the signs and expect them to be put up over the next few months. And lastly, we have continued increasing the capacity of the CDI to support university efforts for the most recent addition of an executive assistant. And we are in the process of hiring two program coordinators. Next slide, please. This is the dashboard uh, that we have uh, demonstrating participation in uh, the implicit bias uh, for hiring managers training program. Uh, if you note, it states here that uh, completed to 66.7%. Um, this dashboard uh, dates from June 15th. Uh, our actual most recent uh, numbers as of today, we're at 87% trained of all hiring managers at the university. It's about 1,200 people so far that we have, uh, we have trained. Um, and if we have maximal attendance in our next five sessions, will be at 94% completed by the end of June. Next slide, please. 
This is uh, a, an example. This is actually the sign, the anti-racism sign that will be displayed around the university. This sign uh, was, uh, we got input from stakeholders, including the Employee Resource Group Anti-Racism Committee. Uh, on this sign, this particular sign is for Dornbecker. There will be signs put up um, in uh, adult um, areas uh, and the wording and uh, the uh, information will be changed accordingly. We're currently working on the logistics of uh, printing up this sign and uh, it will be displayed over the next couple of months across the university. Next slide, please. Policy review has continued. We have, um, there has been a parking policy review with the anti-racism committee, as well as the diversity advisory committee were engaged for input on an equity centered parking policy. Uh, in, in, um, in the field of parking, uh, there has also been a parking policy review with subsequent changes for students with disabilities. We have had uh, multiple stakeholders work to increase the available pronouns for use on badges and a process has been developed to address these requests. Discussions have been initiated on equity and on how equity and anti-racism can be centered in the promotion and tenure process, as well as on the university survey committee. Next slide, please. With regard to health equity, there has been continued work on the Health Disparities Reduction Hub, and it is beginning to be used to guide and support disparities work in the health system. And this work is beginning to encourage community centeredness. And the OHSU Vaccine Equity Committee was stood up to address low vaccination rates in communities of color and has been extremely busy using an equity structure grounded in the philosophy of how do we get to yes. Um, and I will leave further updates on this work to Dr. Don Spite, who will follow me. Uh, this concludes my presentation and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. DeVivier. That's, uh, there's a lot in it, and I'm glad that we continue to get updates from you. It's, it continues to grow and be robust. So we applaud your efforts and you and the team's efforts, because as we know, the team is not just you, it's, it's everyone, um, but also the growing CDI. Um, waiting for to see any questions or comments in the chat, I will say I applaud the, um, the hiring manager training. I think when we started talking about um, conscious bias training a, a, a few years ago and trying to get traction on it. One of the, the things that we wanted to focus on were hiring managers so to make sure that they realize the importance of having this training before going out and, and hiring more people to the organization. So I, I applaud the, the effort. I applaud the 94% and the, and the progress we're making there. Um, one of the things that I had mentioned before was, and, and we'll talk a little bit about this in the vaccine equity, uh, work, but um, the frontline uh, healthcare workers um, also taking that training. We know that training sometimes is difficult because people are busy, and particularly the frontline workers who are called to do so much and uh, with their time, typically are the ones that would say they don't have they don't have the time to do the training, and not because they don't want to. They're just very difficult. So um, I'd love to see how we're doing on frontline healthcare workers, those that are the face of the organization to the community how they're doing in their unconscious, unconscious bias training as well. Yes. So you don't have to answer it now. It's just something that I'd sure. like to put on radar. Great. Thank you. Um, I think Prashant had a comment and a question. Um, yeah. And uh, thank you. This is a follow on to my comment I made earlier uh, when uh, Ms. Barnes had uh, presentation was uh, presented to us. Um, I, I think it's really important for any DEI strategy to have an overt um, goal around disability inclusion. I think uh, one in five people in our human community have a disability, visible or invisible. And I think it's really difficult to have a comprehensive uh, DEI strategy without an overt overt strategy around disability inclusion and a few areas that manifest even when we're thinking about anti-racism and race and gender is uh, intersectionality. We know that the intersectionality between 
race and disability is tremendous, especially when it comes to mental health, for example. And the two, and it's very hard to unpack the two. Things like um, intergenerational trauma, which we know that people of color have disproportionately faced and are facing now based on oppression from generations ago, which results in disabilities today, many of them invisible. So I would love to see uh, overt uh, statements and goals around disability inclusion, uh, because I, I truly don't believe that our DEI strategy can be comprehensive, uh, and especially as a healthcare organization, I think it's especially critical for us to address disability. Uh, so my question is, what are our plans uh, to do that, if any? <laughs> Thanks, sure. Dr. DeVivier. I kind of set you up for that one. That's, that's okay. Thank you so much. Uh, for, first of all, I'd like to say that uh, you're, you're absolutely correct in that um, abilities is, uh, is, is an aspect of, of diversity. Diversity, there, there are a lot of uh, categories that fall under the diversity work, anti-racism being one of them. But there are many others that uh, that we uh, need to address, and uh, completely agree. Uh, it is our plan to pivot toward discussing and working at the area of intersectionalities. Uh, that is absolutely correct. Uh, with the work that I am doing as co-chair of the State Health Equity Committee, uh, completely sensitive and understand uh, the intersectionality of, for instance. Uh, uh, mental health and and, and race uh, and disabilities uh, and race. Uh, so it is our, our goal to pivot toward intersectionalities and discussions. Uh, as we continue to grow at the CDI, uh, it is our plan to continue to offering uh, education uh, curriculums that will uh, look at and educate on those intersectionalities. Um, and I, I can tell you that with regard to um, um, different abilities, our um, ADA director, as well as uh, the, um, the lead from the Office of Student Access, sit on our Diversity Advisory Council. And that is so that uh, our, our policies and our procedures have that perspective uh, ingrained at the, at the beginning um, in addition, we continue to support our uh, employee resource groups, uh, OHSU abilities, uh, to give the same um, uh, support. But what we're also doing is working with employee resource groups to come together and really kind of emphasize that intersectionality. So that's an extremely important point there. I think another, uh, another area where we are starting to work uh, in the provost office, uh, as well as in the different areas like uh, in the research arm, is um, professional development uh, around uh, disabilities and supporting students and, in, and those who are neurodiverse, uh, either through our curriculum designs or student support, but also in terms of our uh, internships and our mentor-mentee relationships. So um, you're, you're, you're absolutely right about that importance and um, moving forward, that is our intent, is to really uh, emphasize those intersectionalities. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you, Dr. DeVivier. I don't see any more comments or questions in the chat. Um, always a pleasure to hear from you, and I really, really want to commend you on the strides we're making. Uh, it's we, we have work to do, continued work to do. It's a it's a journey, not a not a sprint. So um, thank you for all your efforts. Great. Thank you. Uh, now we welcome Dr. Don Spite to talk about vaccine equity. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Chairman Monfries and Board of Directors uh, for the invitation. Uh, I'm really honored to uh, co-chair this committee with uh, Dr. De Vivier and, and certainly honored to be here this afternoon to represent the amazing work of a committed group of individuals who represent the best of what OHSU can be when it comes together to solve a problem. <clears throat> and in this case, the problem was that despite the amazing efforts being put forth at the mass vaccination sites at the Oregon Convention Center, Hillsborough, and PDX, communities of color and those traditionally disenfranchised were falling significantly behind. Next slide. 
There are multiple factors that led to this easy observation early on, and unfortunately in this brief presentation, it would be impossible to unpack them all, but I welcome uh, conversation uh, at the end if, if those when you, people want to discuss that. Um, the Vaccine Equity Committee was formed in February of 2021 with the charge to ensure that every Oregonian has access to COVID-19 vaccine, regardless of race, ethnicity, language spoken, mobility, zip code, education level, occupation, access to technology, socioeconomic or immigration status. And we were asked to be the resource for all OHSU COVID-19 vaccine processes to ensure accountability, cultural humility, and provide mission-based education, advocacy, and outreach. We were also asked to operationalize data-driven vaccination clinics wherever needed. The VEC, as we like to call it, is made up of individuals from across the institution sharing passion for the communities that surround us, as well as high-level competency in the areas in which they work. 70% of the Vaccine Equity Committee members bring a lived experience as a member of a racial or ethnic minority. And I want to specifically call out the tireless efforts of Janine Smith, Kat Phillips, Tisha Schmidt, John Cockerman, Jenny Lee Berry, Leslie Garside, Leslie Garcia, excuse me, Leslie Leda Garside, Mariana Phipps, and Dr. Chris Evans, and Caroline Sachs, whose sweat equity in the trenches is immeasurable and deeply appreciated. I would also like to call out the phenomenal leadership of Kevin O'Boyle and Abigail Tibbs, who've moved mountains to help us succeed in our efforts along the way. Our core workforce consists of seven dedicated medical assistants who support two mobile vans that were acquired through OHA funding. This dynamic core is supplemented by an ethnically, culturally, and linguistically diverse roster of 1,309 OHSU members that have signed up to work with us in the community. Our workforce, uh, community workforce comes from all strata of the institution, from students to residents to faculty uh, to classified and unclassified staff. Next slide, please. As seen here in a couple of recent flyers, the events that we co-hosted with a multitude of partners, both new and old, are community-centered and community-focused. They are intentionally designed to meet people where they are in the language that they prefer, free of many of the structural barriers that often accompany our traditional clinical environments. Our work is conducted in locations that are considered safe spaces throughout the metro area and beyond, such as schools, churches, mosques, temples, community centers, parking lots, and even within an individual's home, even if that home is not a house, but instead a shelter, a locked institution, or a campsite. Next slide. We take great pride in sharing space with cultural humility. We recognize that there are things we don't know, but need to know about the communities we strive to reach. When able, we populate our workforce with individuals who share lived experience with the population we are serving. We show humbleness and ask questions so that we can better understand how to meet the specific needs of the community. We show respect toward the cultures of others. We ask ourselves questions like what language do need to be represented in our communications? What attire should we wear uh, as a workforce when going onto the sites? What pronoun pronouns would our patients prefer? We push ourselves to challenge our own cultural biases, and we recognize that true community partnership must be bilateral and mutually beneficial, and this requires a willingness to share power and control. We know that true partnership requires an, us to advocate for accountability to these same principles within OHSU. Next slide, please. Using the mobile vans as a platform for supplies to secure internet and sometimes even power, we've co-hosted 32 unique events to date and we'll do another in the next two, eight in the next two weeks. We've worked closely with 41 community-based organizations and multi, multiple county programs since the inception of the Vaccine Equity Committee. Our work has been recognized by the governor as instrumental in reaching communities across the region. To date, 384 members have worked 830 shifts with us for a total of 4,372 person hours. So this is a significant lift. What's important to note here is not necessarily the total doses administered, which you'll see in the upper uh, right of the slide, uh, which pales in comparison to the mass fact sites like PDX, which reached well over 250,000 people before it closed last Saturday. But what I want you to focus your attention on is, is the box on, boxes on the left that look at the racial and ethnic makeup of those we're serving. This is a reflection of intentional outreach to ensure inclusion. In comparison, the top line of the race demographic at PDX was 68.98% white, where we see here our demographic is much more diverse. Next slide. Dr. Spite, just before you get too far away from the, um, the humility and, and, and the interaction with the community, I wanted to interrupt you, so I apologize. 
but sure. the communities you're serving with the, with this work um, are typically um, or we've heard um, are somewhat resistant to vaccination. So how has the team encountered that um, in the communities as you go out to do the outreach and, and how have you managed um, some of the resistance? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that later, but I can jump to that now. Um, you know, well, our, the resistance. It, then I'm sorry, I, I didn't want to get away from the other thing. But. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, if, if we don't, uh, if, if I don't address it, I'll be happy to come back to that. Thank you. Um, so uh, going to this uh, the slide here, uh, fast forwarding a month from the, what we just saw on that last slide, we can slide, we continue to see that the numbers of shots in the arms in BIPOC communities continues to grow. Um, in fact, the last week, the number of vaccines administered in our community events surpassed 6,600. And an important secondary impact of this work is the number of medical records numbers that we created. Each of these uh, events represents a powerful new opportunity for a healthcare relationship where previously none existed. The not so good news, which I'm showing here on the right in blue, is that despite a concerted effort, nearly four months of into the vaccine equity effort, the work is nowhere near complete. As the state creeps toward the governor's goal of 70 plus, 70 percent of 18 plus Oregonians receiving a single dose of vaccine, there continues to be a significant disparity within minority populations. And as we can see here, most strikingly among African Americans and African immigrants, we're sitting at less than 40% vaccinated, uh, as well as the, uh, the native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities that are just slightly above that. Uh, I would certainly like to thank uh, Kristen Lassison Drew of HealthShare for creating the dashboards that we've been using to guide our vaccine equity uh, work. As Pastor Ed of Mount Olivet Baptist Church said on Wednesday on a call with representatives of OHA, in the Black community, the house is still on fire and the urgency is real. Projections from the OHA specifically looking at the African American population such suggest that the scaled equivalent of a fifth wave of hospitalizations comparable in size to the fourth wave we saw in the spring is imminent unless the trend in vaccinations uh, is rect uh, rectified. And that devastating impact will be significantly compounded as people begin to take off their masks, uh, as the, uh, the restrictions are lifted and the Delta variant becomes prevalent within our state. Next slide, please. This is not only a concern when you look at communities using racial demographics, but also when you use language to identify communities with low vaccine penetration. We're looking at healthier shared data specifically broken out by language. We see a tale of many parallel worlds in which some communities are doing extremely well, such as the Korean, Vietnamese, Chinese, uh, uh, surpassing the average and others like the Russian speaking and Eastern European communities are lagging far behind at less than 10% vaccinated. Next slide. And so the work of our vaccine equity committee must continue to and evolve, evolve to fit the vaccination landscape. When we entered the space in late March, we found a great deal of eager and motivated people running past those who were willing but without information or access. Over time, we've seen access and vaccine availability issues give way to challenges and with confidence and motivation. We find ourselves now in a highly variable place where confidence, motivation, and lack of interest dominate an environment in which some still lack basic information and access. So in response to the changing landscape, we've evolved our approaches in real time while never abandoning methods, but simply adding more to our toolkit. I can't go through them all here, but, I'm, but uh, certainly this is where the heavy lifting of numerous members of our vaccine equity committee has occurred. And I would like to specifically thank Cambia, Columbia Bank, the Portland Trailblazers, and the OHA for their monetary and in-kind donations that have helped to power these efforts. Next slide. So what's next? Um, certainly the days of the mass vaccination sites are behind us. PDX closed last Saturday. Hillsborough and Richmond uh, Clinic closed today. The Scapoose Clinic closes tomorrow. Uh, we know that the Multnomah Pavilion and the vaccination uh, sites within our OHSU clinic and pharmacies will persist. And we will continue to use data-driven outreach with emphasized emphasis on canvassing and community partnership to reach these uh, most uh, pressing groups, such as the Russian speaking, the youth, the African-American, houseless, homebound, and Medicaid, in which we're seeing growing gaps. We certainly will be transitioning our work to provide COVID education and support services, uh, things that will be necessary as people go back to school, um, coping with chronic disease related to COVID, and the, uh, the milieu of antibody testing enters the, the field. And so we remain data-driven and go where the greatest need is. We continue to use health shared data along with information provided by the state and other resources and continue to partner with OHA, counties, peer hospital networks, and many other community leaders. And at this point, our sunset date is unknown, 
and will continue based on need to develop meaningful approaches to increase vaccination in communities left behind. Last, next slide. In conclusion, in conclusion, we learned a lot in a relatively short period of time. The disparities that led to the disproportionate burden of COVID disease in underserved communities existed long before the pandemic and will remain long after. This work is far from over. Um, anybody that follows uh, British Medical Journal and other some uh, reported, highly reported journals will see that research from Virginia Commonwealth University showed that life expectancy across the country decreased significantly between 2018 and 2020 due to the COVID-19 pandemic. This was the largest decline since World War II. But while white Americans lost 1.36 years, black Americans lost 3.25 years, and Hispanic Americans lost 3.88 years. So the house is still on fire for many. The complex history of medical mistreatment, structural racism, and transactional exploitation creates profound mistrust of health entities in general, and this must be understood as we continue to step into this space. We know that the messenger is as important as the message to build trust, and that there is a critical role for OHSU BIPOC members in community engagement, but it must be done with adequate support to prevent the manifestation as a tax. OHSU sits in an inflection point in which the narrative defining its place in the community can be rewritten. Communities want and need authentic and enduring partnership with OHSU that goes beyond the transactional relationship. Cultural humility must be continuously centered in all aspects of community engagement to achieve true bi-directional partnership. Health equity is an uphill battle that requires not only desire, but the commitment, innovation, appropriation, and often reallocation of resources to be sustainable. And so Chairman Monfries and members of the board, I thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to share our work, and I'd be happy to take any questions. And I can come back to that uh, comment you made, uh, uh, Chair Monfries, if, if you'd like at this point. Sure, yeah, I, I, this is excellent work. Um, we know that it's a challenge to reach these communities, so the work that you and the team are doing um, to be commended. Um, and so I'm interested in, in the reaction as you've gone in and what you guys have seen and how you've overcome it. Absolutely. Um, when we first entered the space in March, I'll be honest, uh, coming off of the Key to Oregon study, we, we faced a significant amount of resistance uh, in the, in the uh, communities that felt that uh, the, the helicoptering in, the transitional nature of the, uh, related to the history of the institution would be at play. And, and it took uh, really a, a statement of commitment that we would be in this space authentically to start to mitigate uh, some of that, that challenge. Uh, it took the, uh, the presence of myself and Dr. Evans and many others in uh, countless uh, community uh, dialogues in the evenings and on weekends to just talk about COVID-19, to just talk about uh, the, the real the devastation in communities to, in order to move to vaccination. Uh, and and that, that work is ongoing. Uh, we certainly know that, that hesitancy uh, in some communities goes beyond just hesitancy and actually to anti-vaccination uh, advocacy. And, and we, we face even those challenges at our events in which uh, we're forced to train ourselves and, and our uh, workforce how to accommodate uh, protesters and, and others. And so, uh, so they're, they're extreme, uh, extremes of, of this. Uh, canvassing is a uh, significant uh, new role for us in which we're going uh, into communities just to provide information as oftentimes in a door-to-door, -door, person to person fashion. So lots of, lots of different uh, elements of the work. And incentives uh, is a, uh, one of the newest players on, um, on the landscape. Uh, we have cur are currently um, using OHA um, allocated dollars to provide uh, incentives for those receiving first vaccination doses. Great, thank you. I think Mr. Zika has a comment. Yeah, I just appreciate what you guys are doing. It's an amazing effort. Um, I don't, uh, not heavily involved in some of the communities that you are, but I'm heavily involved in rural Oregon and going into some of these spaces, uh, people just, a lack of trust and um, scared of government, worried about the science, the multiple, you get some from CDC and then you get something else. And it's almost at times people get shamed for actually getting the vaccine. So. In some of our workplaces, people won't wear a sticker that says I got the vaccine because they'll be uh, hit upon by some of their neighbors. So I can only appreciate the challenge you're trying to go through because you have the historical stuff you're trying to bust through as well. But uh, it is really hard and it's really not a question anymore of kind of access of having this stuff because it's everywhere. 
It's just convincing people um, to look at some of the science and the societal benefits as opposed to me personally and whether I'm going to get sick and die. It's, it's just a very difficult task that you're taking on. I appreciate it. Absolutely. And, and when, you, when you look at, at some environments in which you have uh, workers who, who we, we've been doing work in the, um, the rural migrant communities, when you look at people that, that live in a, uh, a low autonomy, low wage environment, um, the, the, um, the sort of revealing that they are sick, that they might have COVID, that they should be tested potentially takes them off the line, takes them out of the field. And so you, you run into even uh, sort of socioeconomic barriers to, to fighting the, the pandemic because people would, would rather just suck it up and, and not even do anything different than their neighbors because, it, because declaring they have COVID or testing for COVID could mean that you don't eat. And so these are- Yeah, and I think in some of the Latino communities that we've been involved in, some, of, some people say there's a religious overtone too, and I, I don't tend to understand that, but there's just a lot of hesitancy, hesitancy out there and you're seeing it in terms of these rates go down and the trouble we're getting just to get to the 70%, it's just taking a long time, so thanks. The, uh, what we find is that the, the top uh, reasons for, for when, we, when we're dealing with, uh, with lack of confidence really is about the side effects. Um, it's easier to find misinformation than in true information. And then secondly, the, the distrust of, of large institutions and systems, including the government, both the pace of vaccination development and, and the, uh, the efficacy of, of the data and the truthfulness of the data. Um, and the largest reason for people not to be vaccinated currently, is particularly in that 18 to 30 range, is people that feel like, you know, it's, they, they're safe. They don't hang around people that, that are at risk, that they don't fear that they're going to get sick, even though they understand that, that they uh, really might. Thank you. Ms. Byer has a question. We, we've heard an, a number of times now that it's possible that we may need to have booster shots. Are you thinking about how you would follow up with these same populations if that is required down the road? And you know, knowing what you've learned, I'm sure you've learned a lot going through this process. And how would you now maybe think about approaching some of those same uh, populations from a more, you know, informed or experienced basis if you need to go back and and uh, double down on the vaccinations. Absolutely, and thank you for that question. Um, I, I think certainly the, the, the notion of a committed, enduring partnership that is authentic with the communities is, is part of the work that we're trying to, to, the groundwork that we're trying to lay out. Um, it, it's, you know, the, the institutional will would have to decide if, if a mass vac site would stand up but, but we know that, that these community-based programs are going to be critical to maintaining the, the, uh, the, the reduction in barriers to access from everything from disability to all the things we talked about earlier. And that what we will take from, from an institutional standpoint is, is really the, the operationalization of a community health workforce potentially that would, that would be in this space, not as a second or third job, but, but really as a, uh, as a as a job to deliver community an operational arm of community health. Uh, but in the short term, you know, we have mechanisms by which uh, seasonal vaccines are, are rolled out and implemented. And, and many of those structures and best practices uh, will likely need to play, uh, come into play. And Derek, I, I certainly, if you have any other thoughts as co-chair, uh, please let me let you step yeah, in. Yeah, sure. So um, thanks, Don. Um, just Echoing what what you have said is um, we would like to not be in a position where we have to go back where we are still present. We're building relationships um, and hopefully that these will be enduring relationships because what we know is that COVID-19 is the acute crisis and what was unmasked during COVID-19 were the health disparities uh, that propagated the acute crisis in these communities of color. So it's going to be very, very important uh, that once we um, uh, continue to move forward, that we are able to pivot to address what is still a chronic crisis of health disparities in, in these marginalized communities. Great. Well, thank you. Um, work still to be done um, as as Ruth pointed out this is an ongoing crisis and and 
it, it will become a regular thing that we have to do to engage these communities in not just vaccination uh, inequity, but just overall healthcare inequity as Dr. DeVivi spoke about. So uh, thank you for the work um, in the immediate crisis. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you again as we move forward. Can I make one more comment if it's okay with you? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that, that as we look at there's the work of the institution, there's also the work of communities and there's also the work of the individuals. And I think that as the, the, we mentioned at the, the outset of this conversation, the, the state is getting ready to lift the mandates and, and we know that, that that potentially uh, puts those most at risk really in, in jeopardy. And I think that, that the endured vigilance of the community is, is important. And, and the individual accountability that we all can take to actually reach out to somebody that we know that's not being vaccinated and really spread that word. Uh, it's, it's pretty clear that unvaccinated people hang around unvaccinated people and, and breaking into those circles is gonna be critical for us all to uh, to move this, this issue. So just wanted to challenge all of that are listening that, that there is an opportunity for for every Oregonian to influence another Oregonian that's not vaccinated to move this pandemic behind us. Well said, well said, thank you. So we'll move uh, to the next session with uh, the School of Nursing, DE&I um, and anti-racism activities, uh, Dr. Susan Bakewell sachs and Dr. Karen Riefenstein. Thank you for joining us. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. I did see uh, Dean Bakewell Sachs a few moments ago, but I'm not seeing her right now. But I'm not able to see everyone because of yeah, the I saw her a little bit ago yeah. too. Um, yeah, so she's on. I'm seeing a low bandwidth signal on her icon. Okay. Ah, uh, yes. There also have been unexplained aerial phenomena, so you never know. <laughs> Dean Bakewell Sachs, are you? Would you be able to um, uh, start the presentation without video and just audio? Uh, she just sent me a text and she just said she's having a network problem all of a sudden. So I will send her a text and see if she's able to hear you. Um, see if she can join by uh, phone. I'm waiting for her text back. No problem. Hey, uh, Dr. Spite, while, while you're there, I can ask a follow-up question. We were just staying on time. But how did you guys identify the community partners to engage with, to actually get that credibility in the community? Because it's not like we just kind of helicoptered in and said, hey, we're here to, to put uh, vaccines in arms. And I'm sure you, you identified the community leaders that you needed to to connect with? How did you do that? Well, I think that some of it is a reflection of the deep connections that OHSU members already have within the community. Um, you know, for example, I, I'm the I, a sitting board chair of the North by Northeast Community Health uh, Clinic. Leslie Garcia is deeply uh, connected in the Latinx community. Ginny Lee Berry as the um, community relations manager is deeply connected. And so we started with leveraging uh, the existing relationships that have been there for years. Uh, and, and as I mentioned before, it really is about the, the messenger 
as much as the message. And, and as those messengers go to their the people they know and the people that they know can advocate and vouch for them, then you see that that other groups come on board watching the behavior, watching the, um, the demonstration of, of action rather than, than words. Uh, we, our initial uh, pilot uh, work started with a, an organization called the Bridge Pomoja Coalition of African and African American Faith Leaders that was uh, co-directed by Lavelle Thomas and, and uh, Pastor Mark Jackson at Oasis of Praise. And it was through a series of dialogues that started with myself and Chris Evans that went all the way back to, uh, to testing and then continued through, uh, through controlled clinical trials that then led to uh, opportunities for action when vaccines became available. And so these, these relationships were, were cultivated and mentored uh, throughout that process. And, and many of us, you know, that's why I said that the VEC is 70% people with lived experience in the community. And, and it's really the leveraging of those, uh, those relationships. Thank you for that. Thanks for uh, answering that. That was in my back pocket. But we have Dean Bakewell Sachs with us now uh, after some technical difficulties. No worries. We all have had it in this year and a half of, of video meetings. So uh, we'll, uh, we we know how that goes. So I do apologize. No, uh, no need. No. Need. <laughs> thank Thanks. you. Thank you so much. Um, our HVAC has been uh, broken today by a service repair person and then my Wi-Fi went out. So I don't know. It's Friday. Anyway, um, good afternoon, Chair Monfries, uh, President Jacobs, and members of the board, and thank you so much for inviting us today to offer this brief update. It is my pleasure to have you meet today Dr. Karen Reifenstein, our Senior Associate Dean for Student Affairs and Diversity, who joined us in February of 2020. And we have uh, divided the presentation, so I will start us off. Uh, first slide, please. You can see from these highlights that in 2012, the School of Nursing established the position of Senior Associate Dean for Student Affairs and Diversity. And uh, at, uh, around that time, we were also recognizing the need to diverse, focus on diversifying the uh, nursing profession to help align the nursing workforce better with the demographics of, of those we serve. So as a school, we sought federal funding to catalyze our work, and we received grants through the Health Resources Services Administration, or HRSA, their Nursing Workforce Diversity Program in 2013 and 2017. These grants were designed to enhance our ability to attract uh, and advance a diverse student body, and we used mechanisms of holistic admissions, multicultural curriculum development, expanded student services for learner success, uh, and uh, established a school diversity advisory group. It was actually in 2014 that we developed the first diversity action plan. And in 2018, we began to offer unconscious bias training across all of our campuses. In 2019, we were one of six schools of nursing nationally that were recognized for the social determinants of health and population health uh, curricula that we that we offer, and particularly also our clinical experiences, which are community based through our interprofessional care access network. Our anti racism focus began in 2020 with our anti racism statement. Next slide, please. Uh, Healthy Steps um, stands for advancing health equity through student empowerment and professional success. And this is the model that we were able to develop through our HRSA funding. The model provides evidence-based uh, individual approaches to address so social determinants of education. And those include financial, uh, academic, and social supports to address barriers to student success. Uh, and the main financial uh, mechanism for us was that the federal grants allowed us to uh, provide substantial scholarship support. Uh, internal and external community partnerships to provide real world guidance, both for us as, as the model was in development, as well as for the students. And increased capacity to address health disparities in Oregon through increased educational experiences for nursing students in medically underserved communities. Our targets uh, were underrepresented minorities, first in family, retention. We were very focused on admitting, enrolling them, uh, and uh, retaining them through graduation, and to achieve on-time graduation. Uh, next slide, please. In this slide, you can see the impact of the 2013 and 2017 grants 
on underrepresented minority student enrollments for both undergraduate and graduate students, comparing where we were in uh, 2011 with where we uh, were, were uh, in 2020 at the um, end of this data point. Next slide, please. This slide highlights the scholarships and the stipends awarded through our most recent grant, uh, $807,949 in scholarships and stipends to 99 undergraduate students and 14 uh, graduate students. Um, and uh, the vast majority of those of all in family to attend college and all graduated and nearly all graduated on time. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a particularly important slide showing of the total on-time graduation rates of our pre-licensure students in the accelerated baccalaureate, that's the ABS, and the baccalaureate, the BS programs. And overall, you can see that on-time graduation rates of our underrepresented minority students were generally equal to or better than the total on-time graduation rates overall. And uh, we have seen that as a, as a real success of this program. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Reifenstein. Okay. Next slide, please. And thank you, Dean Beckwell Sachs, for the introduction. And I'm happy to have this opportunity to share highlights of our journey on diversity, equity, inclusion, and anti racism with all of you. So, to provide some background, the School of Nursing created comprehensive planning in 2019, including a people culture goal, which states strengthen a sense of community based on inclusivity, diversity, and equity, where we all have an opportunity to succeed and be our best selves. As you see in the slide, in June 2020, we had a forum for students, staff, and faculty entitled The Importance of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, Standing Up Against Structural Racism. Some results from this forum pointed to a need for ongoing unconscious bias training, a need to continue uh, addressing issues regarding diversity and inclusion among both students and faculty, bystander ally training, and the need to focus on anti-racism and a multicultural curriculum, especially as it pertains to increasing education about racism and healthcare disparities. Next slide, please. The following month, the School of Nursing produced a statement of commitment to anti-racism with immediate initial anti-racism actions, which includes 15 distinct items, some of which Oh, actions already have been taken. Number one, create an anti-racism repository of resources for faculty, staff, and students, including multicultural resources. For the first bullet point, IT helped uh, me create a diversity website tab on the face page of the School of Nursing website, and this repository has been established and further development continues. Here there's information and resources related to diversity and inclusion for students, staff, and faculty, and there are also other links to uh, CDI and other resources as well. The second and third bullet points involve listening to students and faculty regarding these issues and providing opportunities for dialogue and actions. Some of this has been initiated with faculty and some informal mentoring has resulted with students. The final bullet, bullet I'm sorry, involves examining clinical course outcomes, rubrics, uh, language regarding system biases and incorporate more opportunity for students to pay attention to racism that exists in the microsystems of care. A couple of our campuses across the state are reviewing courses as part of a pilot study, and another is re reviewing course activities as well. Next slide, please. Additional immediate actions are shown on this slide. Regarding the first bullet, social justice, there was a Monmouth NAACP virtual event, which faculty, students, and staff attended. And recently, the campus held a panel discussion on social justice and health care in early June. The second bullet point refers to the need to conduct a review of cases, uh, exam questions, assignments, simulations across the curricula to ensure lack of bias, accuracy, diversity, and multicultural examples. Linda Felber, a member of our School of Nursing faculty, and along with another collaborator, developed a photo diversity repository to help students more accurately vis visualize pathophysiological conditions of diverse populations and increase awareness of issues related to health and diversity. Bullet point three 
refers to student unconscious bias training. This is ongoing. And the CDI will be updating training, which includes anti-racism education. Bullet point four refers to each faculty member developing a personal anti-racism goal and faculty started this year, this last year. Next slide, please. Further immediate initial actions included bullet point one refers to incorporating a faculty anti-racism goal as part of their faculty performance review. And this was approved by a faculty vote last month. Bullet point two, support and interprofessional education focus on anti-racism has not yet been done, but preliminary work has been started. Bullet point three, health systems and organizational leadership program, racism courses. There were courses during the fall, winter, and spring. And for the last bullet point, the update, the statement on diversity, equity, and inclusion for the School of Nursing catalog, this was completed last July. Next slide, please. Finally, this shows the remaining immediate actions. Uh, bullet point one refers to the creation of pre and post conferences to support faculty in addressing and talking about racism and that is planned for fall 2021 and initial work for this has started. Bullet points two and three refer to creating safe places for faculty, staff and students and I've provided informal opportunities, and this will be a continuing goal for the academic year 2022. There have been two School of Nursing underrepresented student interest groups that I started, and CDI has also been involved with this effort. The two groups are Black Student Nurses, Umoja, and a Latinx group, which has just started. Two other School of Nursing faculty members serve as the faculty advisors for these groups, and I am also the co-faculty advisor for each group. Bullet point four is for the monthly DEI webinars offered to all School of Nursing members, and we always record all of these. The final bullet point refers to Leadership Council members reading the book, Me and White Supremacy, and the ensuing discussions. This will be completed next week, and then we will select a new book. I've also created the Inspired by a Leader series, which is a School of Nursing Diversity Advisory Group effort to highlight leaders across OHSU who are doing significant work related to diversity, equity, inclusion, and the inaugural photo loop featured Dr. Rosemary Hemmings, Director of Social Work in the School of Dentistry. Um, again, thank you for this opportunity to share our journey with you. Thank you both. Uh, and it looks like Mr. Dubai has a question for you, Dr. Ravenstein. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Mr. Monfries. Uh, first of all, welcome. Uh, great you. to have you on board at OHSU. Thank, thank you for you. your good work so far. Um, thank you. A couple of questions. Uh, does the July 2020 statement and uh, the uh, training that you're also putting folks through include uh, overt uh, statements around goals for inclusion of people with disabilities, uh, especially goals around students with disabilities as a major underrepresented group? Well, our focus um, primarily, we are looking at universal design. That is one thing that we, we are doing. And um, our other focus, will we will be looking at that, but primarily we've been working with um, Jennifer Gossett in uh, uh, student accommodations, and that's been our focus so far. And we are you know, at the outset of this, but we will be focusing on this in the future. Okay. Uh, is there is there an overt uh, statement or uh, environment uh, so that students can uh, disclose disabilities without uh, fear of stigma? Uh, in other words, is there an overt policy around uh, accommodations if people request them uh, or uh, accessibility? I'm happy to answer that question. Um, yes, the OHSU policy and the School of Nursing policy with regard to accommodation following all ADA and ADAA guidelines for that, um, uh, we have instituted at the school level and we work very closely with the provost level on that. Um, we also have um, a program where um, every um, campus and, uh, and program has a program accommodation liaison. Uh, we have guidelines with when that individual or faculty would ever need to know the particular 
um, elements of, of why a student has an accommodation. Um, we follow those guidelines very, very closely. Um, and part of our learner success um, efforts that we actually learned a great deal about and have instituted as part of the Healthy Steps work um, has really helped us to expand um, student support um, overall and has benefited all of the students, of course, um, mm -hmm. but has particularly been focused on uh, learning inclusion. Okay, uh, last question, and you may or may not have the answer to this now, uh, so we can take it offline, but uh, what percentage of the current student population uh, is uh, our students with disabilities? Uh, well, that is a, um, we have that for the school level, um, not by a demographic group. So total school level is 6% um, of those who disclose. Um, we have 14% uh, of data that is either missing on that or, or choose not to answer. Okay. So our data are incomplete. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks for asking. Ms. Byer. Thank you. Um, um, I think this is a great presentation. And um, one of the things I think you have as an advantage here is your regional campuses and the um, fact that you are in locations where you might have um, you know, opportunity more so than maybe up on the hill or whatever to um, attract and, and work with um, um, minority type uh, uh, students. And one of um, the other thing I was going to uh, comment on is that for those of us who have had opportunity to, um, you know, have parents or whatever in long term care facilities and the like, one thing that jumps out is it seems like there there is a disproportionate representation of um, um, people of, of, you know, different cultures and different um, ethnicities in those types of facilities. And it says something to me that, A, there's a lot of um, interest in uh, medical careers, nursing careers. Um, it's one of those things, there may not be interest in vaccines across all different cultures, as we heard in the prior presentation, but there seems to be an interest in, in medical service. And I'm wondering whether you, um, you know, where you're really focused on just kind of the traditional student entering your programs, or whether you're looking at, um, you know, including and recruiting from some people that may be in sort of lower levels of service in nursing that might, you know, have it, you know, be at, in a particularly great place, especially in the regional areas to um, participate in programs that would really, you know, advance them to a bachelor's and, you know, at a registered nurse position. Thank you for asking that question. So the first thing that I um, am happy to share with you is that we are the university lead with the Oregon Consortium for Nursing Education. This is a consortium that was um, uh, initiated in 2004 and launched in 2006. And we are partnered with 11 community colleges around the state. It is one curriculum. Students can do the first two years at a community college and do their third year with OHSU, or they can do all three years with OHSU. Um, we know from that, uh, well, uh, we, we, we know from that that we have been able to draw students um, uh, into, that, um, into that curriculum. Um, the other thing that we did was two years ago, um, and you may recall this, we reduced the tuition of our baccalaureate completion program by 37%. And we did that specifically because we were all, had only been capturing 30% of our graduates over time of our ACNI partner community colleges. And one of the barriers for them to continue to, to complete their bachelor's with us was the cost of tuition. We have um, increased um, uh, 135% <laughs> in our um, enrollment in the baccalaureate completion from our ACNI partners. And we, um, we that is, helping us to diversify um, overall. Uh, we do certainly recognize that, um, uh, that individuals um, who start particularly as certified nursing assistants and others often want on that trajectory. And, um, and most of our community college partners offer those CNA programs. And so we, we are able to connect potentially with um, so at least some of those potential students uh, through those mechanisms. Great. Um, 
don't see any other questions. My comments would be the, the work, uh, as we said, is, is ongoing and, and there's a lot in it. Um, question for Dr. Reifenstein. I think we've I've talked to, to Dr. De Vivier about you know, not one person holding the bag, but the community. Um, in the presentation, you mentioned a, a few things you are doing. Um, so interested in the community ar around you uh, with regard to supporting these efforts and how we're bringing everybody in. I'm, I'm sorry, my audio. Can you just, was there, could you repeat the question? No problem. Just a, a question in your presentation, you mentioned a, a few of the things you're doing and there's a lot going on and I commend the school for, for all of those things. Um, but was wondering about the lean in from others in the community because we know it takes the entire community leaning in on this for it to be successful. So how is that support uh, that you're seeing in all the efforts? Well, I will say in terms of, I didn't hear you mention Dr. Duvivier, and so uh, he's been very helpful and very supportive along with Andrew, who's, who's DC, I think I'm pronouncing it correctly, from the CDI, in supporting our, especially our uh, newly formed student uh, nursing interest groups. Um, so we've been, they've been participating in that. Um, also, in terms of our interprofessional education, we've spoken about, but we do not have them yet, some speakers that will be coming. Um, so uh, Dr. Duvivier and I are uh, working toward that. Um, I don't want to say the names of the people we're trying to get just yet because I don't have confirmation, um, but hopefully by the fall or um, early winter term, we will have someone to, to, do, to do help with that as well. Um, the other things that have been going on in terms of Inspired by a Leader series um, that is on the photo loop, um, he's been very supportive, the CDI, in terms of uh, providing support um, with me as well on that. So it's been uh, very supportive and very helpful all the way around. Thank you. And then maybe for Dr. De Vivier, um, a lot of good work being done here, and I know that uh, you, you've been on hand for all of the, the, the groups that have presented. I don't know that we've asked how are we taking best practices that we that we hear about. So a lot of good things on on this list of uh, activities. How are we making sure we take best practices and share them amongst the other um, areas of the institution? Yeah, sure. So uh, thank you for that question. So what 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 we are doing are, for instance. Uh, what, what I have been doing is meeting with uh, leaders uh, across the university and uh, functioning as a conduit of information and best practices. But we also have uh, meetings, for instance, with our anti-racism committee, where their representation, for instance, Dr. Reifenstein sits on our anti-racism committee, um, on our diversity uh, advisory uh, committee, which has representation from multiple members uh, student representation, AFSCME rep representation, ONA representation, uh, administration representation. Uh, so we have these committees where we are able to, uh, when we are reviewing policies and practices and procedures and uh, programs that we're able to share and learn from each other. Um, and I am actually meet on a regular basis, for instance, with Dr. Uh, Reifenstein, I meet on a regular basis with Leslie Garcia and the school of nurse and uh, school of medicine, uh, Dr. Um, Peter Bar Gillespie and I meet on a regular basis. Uh, for instance, most recently, uh, we met um, and uh, with the directors of the RIC uh, program there, uh, and uh, they have actually attended national, a na most recently a national meeting uh, where they uh, gain many resources and access to best practices. And so we will work with them to disseminate that information across the university. Great, sounds good. Well, thank you, Dr. Beckwell Sachs and Dr. Reifenstein for your presentation. Uh, great to hear the activities going on. And uh, Dr. Spite and Dr. Duvivier as well on the all the anti-racism initiatives going on. We've taken some time here, but, but um, given where we are as a community, it's important that we have these discussions and I want to keep it in, in front of the, the board members so and the community. So thank you all for uh, your presentations. Um, with that, I think we have just one bit of administrative uh, duties to take care of before we allow you out into the um, heat. And that is um, to approve. I need a motion and, and a second 
uh, on the resolution that's in your documents for the new board committees um, make up with the addition of uh, Mr. Carlson. So moved. Is there a second? I'll second it, Ms. Steve. Any questions on the committee makeup? Seeing none, uh, can we just uh, do a, a simple vote, uh, Ms. Seeley? So yes, all in favor? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. The new committee uh, makeup is approved uh, unanimously. Uh, to be fair, as we have, um, I believe, a, a new student member joining uh, sometime this summer or fall, we will come back to this, perhaps, as Ms. Seeley says, hopefully. Um, so, you know, you all know, as we have uh, changes to the board structure, we will come back and the committees always have to be ratified. So thank you for that at this time. Um, with that, we will be adjourned to go into the heat. Um, you all be well, um, be safe, and I look forward to speaking with you again really, really soon. So um, Godspeed and uh, best wishes. Thanks for all for a long meeting and it was full and we appreciate the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.